Yeah, so in regards to selling your house, day of the week. I usually like to go live on Thursday. If in a perfect world, the weather is great all week, I'm gonna get photos done on Monday. It allows me that time to populate the pretty pictures and videos that we just produced on the back end of things like Instagram and Facebook to a particular neighborhood or to a buyer segment that feels like they get an inside track. And then on Thursday, that's gonna go live on MLS, which is going to then send it out to every agent and buyer looking for exactly your house and give them a 24 hour period to then get in. So Thursday is the ideal day to go live with a few days before that to do pre-marketing. In terms of time of year, Charleston never truly has an off season unless we've got a hurricane off the coast or right around a few of the major holidays, you'll, you'll see slowdown just because people are out of town. But on the whole, Charleston truly never slows down. So to determine the listing price of a home, you're going to run what are called comps. And all that is is usually a six to max 12 month snapshot of sold homes. Now you can, you can look at what's available and what's under contract as some form of an impact or a barometer, but you're gonna look at sold homes to really data collect on where you should list. Now, a lot of people try to interpret that data a little bit differently, but on the whole, most people are gonna get uh, a loan, which is gonna be contingent on an appraisal. And that appraiser is going to run a lot of those same comps. So that's how we determine the value of a home. Ultimately, the true fair market value of a home is whatever a, a buyer is willing to pay for it. But on the whole, they're gonna be running a lot of the same data that we will, and that's how you determine the value. So one of the main dangers of overpricing a home is letting it get quote unquote stale. When you go live on market, you're going to have your max exposure. So not only are we doing a little bit of pre-marketing, but the second it goes live on MLS, it's repopulating on a bunch of third party sites like Zillow, Trulia, Realtor.com. So you're getting your max exposure during that time. If you've overpriced the home, a lot of people are going to sit there and say, hey, based off of your comps, we think you're 10, 50, 100 grand over where you should be, and you risk losing out on buyers who go, they're not realistic. And as time goes on, you're losing that exposure. So you're risking buyers going away. And if you truly have a time frame in which you need to sell, you're risking not selling. So my two cents on open houses is that actually as an agent benefits me 10X more than it's actually gonna sell your home. So in the era of the internet, somebody is 97% more likely, because that's where 97% of buyers find their home online first, they're gonna find it there. Maybe they see it a uh, yard sign driving through the neighborhood, but the likelihood of someone just cruising through during the day and time that I'm sitting in the house with a few balloons and a yard sign outside coming in and making an actual offer is very minimal in a digital era. So an open house really benefits me to endear myself to your nosy neighbors, a handful of your friends that might come in and see the home, or a buyer who comes in off the street and says, oh hey, we love this house, it's out of our price range, but maybe you can show us something else. So a better use of my time is always going to be doing everything built on the apps on your phone to show off your house. Biggest misperception uh, regarding agents, I think, is that we're all created equally and held to the same standard. There's a problem in our industry of a very, very low barrier to entry. And the assumption is because we all essentially charge about the same amount, that you're getting the same level of service. So when you sit down uh, to either go find and purchase a home or sell your home, I always highly encourage people to sit down with two or three different agents to understand exactly what you're getting because time in the industry, experience, qualification, and just also some general know-how are gonna play out in a big way at very critical moments that you may not be yet aware of until you get to that time frame. So you really have to do your homework, look at testimonials. I mean, I even sometimes occasionally have people call my former clients so that they can get a better sense of who I am and how I work. So in terms of showings, at least in the Charleston area, on average, if I get 10 showings, I should get an offer. 
if I go over that, if I have, say, a, a house in a great neighborhood that gets 20, 25, 30 showings, but no offer, I've either mispriced it, perhaps there's something wrong with the floor plan, or perhaps there's something that at that stage, most buyers are going to have a reservation on. Now, the beauty of where we live is when people schedule showings, it goes through an app, and then we can get feedback from the agent during that app. And if we're getting 15, 20 showings, and I can show that pattern to a seller of, hey, we've either overpriced it, or we need to adjust the price, or figure out a solution, that's the time I do those things. So big importance to having your, your home listed on the MLS is just exposure. While a lot of us have started to realize the benefit of pre-marketing home on top of the apps built on your phone and on the internet, ultimately the, the multiple listing service is exactly that. It's where every home that an agent realtor is going to put every bit of data and information. And the second that gets put on live on MLS, any agent who has set up a search for a buyer that they are working with, an email gets sent out in real time to that buyer and then gains exposure. You're also then gaining exposure on the back end of third party sites that are real estate focused so that people can find you in search. I mean, I try to do a ton of work up front, pre-marketing on Instagram, Facebook, uh, pre-roll YouTube, but ultimately that's gonna be your max exposure. My typical route anytime I get multiple offers, whether it's two or whether it's 20, I like to do a scenario what's called highest and best. The reason being, anytime you have multiple parties interested and likely showings continuing to come in, I like to give everybody the best shot. Gone, I personally believe, are the days where you see the agent on the phone, much like on TV shows, playing offers off of each other. And that certainly can and does happen. But in my professional opinion, the fairest way to handle that circumstance without literally pissing anybody off is saying, hey, we are thrilled that we have so much interest. And obviously we've done a few things right in pricing the home and getting it ready to sell. However, what we wanna do is set a certain day and a certain time to say, give us your highest price and your best terms so we can essentially pros and cons those offers against each other and make a decision on who we're most comfortable with. And then if a party is second or third or 15th, they can so choose to remain as a backup offer. In a world gone digital, I would be remiss if I didn't overspend on photography, video, occasionally 3D and getting architectural plans of a house, whatever it truly needs to sell because Think about how you spend your day to day flipping through tons and tons and tons of photos, pictures, videos on whatever social platform you exist. So if I don't do my job in showcasing your house through pretty pictures and videos, it's gonna get lost as a, an actual buyer. It's flipping through literally tens of hundreds of different listings. So to reverse engineer how that person thinks, I've gotta take probably the prettiest photo, whether it's a great living room, the curb appeal outside, the pool in the backyard, whatever it is that I think is gonna make you stop for three seconds and then start storytelling about that house. Someone, by the time they get to your house, will have already just about decided whether they'd wanna live there or not because they can gather all that information but then also the data thereafter, you're basically fighting a losing battle if you do not hire really, really qualified professionals to do that for you. So disclosure in real estate, the seller's property disclosure is essentially answering all the questions to their best knowledge of the home. Now, if it's a newer house, obviously the builder's not gonna necessarily provide a seller's disclosure because you're having multiple inspections along the way. But for a pre-owned home that's been lived in, if they had things like a roof leak, if the HVAC unit needed to be replaced, this is the time where they're going to factor in everything that they know about the house and then the buyer takes that information and signs it with the offer, building in if the roof needs to be replaced soon, if there are some repairs that they are aware of that they know need to be made, needs to be built into the value of that offer. 
So dual agency to me is a four letter word. I personally don't practice it because you're essentially representing, you are representing both buyer and seller simultaneously. I don't know a way that you can do that without showing some favoritism towards one or the other. So you likely know one client better than the other one. At that stage, to truly do dual agency properly, you are a glorified paper pusher providing no real advice, which is why we're here, to either party. So that's why I do not practice dual agency and I do not think it's a thing that's healthy in any real estate contract. In a 2019 world, my two cents, and obviously I'm biased operating as a lone wolf agent with a small team, I do not think that brand necessarily matters in the big picture. Your personal brand as an agent, 100%. But the brand of a large brokerage, I personally believe, no longer matters. In fact, my parents, when they were selling our house up in Pennsylvania, went through something similar where they were going to utilize a larger real estate brokerage because of all the things that were important in the 1980s and 1990s of having a brick and mortar and a large team and tons of agents. But again, in an era gone digital, I have access to all those same agents. And in fact, we often are now going, instead of from B to B, we're going direct to consumer. So my listing is gonna go directly to the consumer's email, directly to their Facebook feed sometimes, directly to their Instagram feed. So if you have a qualified agent that you know does transactions in a particular area, in a particular neighborhood, that's more important than the brand of the larger brokerage anymore. Insta Travis, to answer your question about lease backs in a deal, it's not going to necessarily impact your mortgage one way or another. And in fact, it's a very common practice for someone that's selling their home and then purchasing another. So if you had a sale, say on July 1st of your home, and you either needed those funds or really didn't want to carry two mortgages for an extended period of time, if you can negotiate in a temporary lease back, all that means is you're gonna have the closing on the house, but then still remain as an occupant during that time, providing usually a small lease back of a week, two, maybe even a month at max for you to move your things out, but then have those funds to be able to go purchase your next property. It's actually a very common practice. So Megan, answer your question about the best time of year to buy in Charleston. My two cents is, other buyers aren't out. That time period is usually sort of Thanksgiving to Christmas. There's also a weird psychological aspect of if a home's been sitting and we're nearing the end of the year. I mean, personally, I've bought three of my own homes during that period and just said, hey, you've been sitting for months. I'm ready to make a low ball offer that I think is closer to fair market value. That's typically the time I find the best deals. However, most people are out and most inventory tends to turn over during that traditional spring period. As we've had a run up in value, not just nationally, but here in Charleston as well, there has been a point where we, that we've started to reach where people are habitually overpricing their home. Now this is binary. On one hand, people see their neighbors or they just go on the internet and see high prices on homes in their neighborhood and automatically assume, hey, I have a home of similar size, I should be able to sell for that without taking into consideration whether that home had certain improvements in it. But then on the whole, we also have a ton of agents in town who are a little bit newer and sometimes in order to get business are happy to take on a higher price home even if they don't think they can get it simply to get their yard sign in the yard. Good question from Jinx about improvement. My two cents is you can always spend a lot of time, energy, and, and resources into major components of the house that are selling features like the kitchen and master bath. However, if you want the best ROI, especially if you're on a shorter time frame, I'm a huge proponent of lighting and plumbing fixtures to modernize the space, and then of course just good, clean paint throughout, making everything fairly neutral, so that a prospective buyer, A, looks at it as a good cleaned up space, but then B can also envision some of their own stuff without a stark contrast and color that they might not like. So I'm a big fan of, of neutral colors and paint and then plumbing and lighting fixtures throughout. So in regards to a pool, the, the jury's kind of out on resale because an appraiser actually gives you no value for a pool. Now in Charleston, South Carolina, where it's stinking hot, having a pool sounds great. It's just 
Some buyers may really want them and, ha and desire to have them, while others may look at it as just something to maintain and something that's going to be expensive over time. So it's, it's a total coin flip in terms of uh, value uh, and truly being in the eye of the beholder of the buyer. So that's why I would say there's really no impact on resale. Uh, you, it's, it's truly a judgment call on what you want.